In this Torah reading, we not only meet a foreign prophet, we meet a very interesting donkey that he's riding on. What's happening is that he's been hired by the Midianite king to go and curse Israel, but God has told him he shouldn't go, and he's going anyway. And then the Torah tells us that on the way, there's an angel standing in front of the path that's blocking the donkey from going. And although the donkey sees the angel, the prophet doesn't. And because the donkey stops, the prophet starts hitting him, unaware of why he stopped. And so the, the donkey tries to move to the left, and the angel moves. The donkey tries to move to the right, and the angel moves. The donkey stands and tries to go forward. The angel's blocking his way in front, so the donkey finally just sits down, can't do anything about it. And then we're told that miraculously, the donkey is able to speak to the prophet to basically say, Stop it! Get off my back! Don't you see there's an angel standing there? And it's a wonderful moment because it, it's actually filled with humor. It's filled with irony that the donkey is telling the prophet, don't you see the angel standing over there? And in truth, the prophet isn't seeing the angel standing over there because he's selling his prophecy to the highest bidder. So he's very far from seeing what's going on in the world around him. But the text itself opens questions to us of angels. What's going on with the angels? Are there angels standing in front of animals? Do they see them? Do we not? Who are these things? What are these things? And so we're going to take a quick look at just an overview of what are angels in Judaism. And when we look at it, we realize that angels are actually our older created sibling species. So we're told that um, Although we, humanity, are created on the sixth day, angels are created for us. That makes them older than us. And we're sibling species because, of course, we all share the same divine parent. And it also now sets up an interesting dynamic because it is definitely going to be a sibling dynamic that exists between us and angels. And there are so many different kinds of angels, just as there are so many different kinds of people. So when we look at some of the categories that we have for angels in our text, we know that, first of all, there are messenger angels. We see those occurring in and out of Torah. We see them occurring in and out of our literature quite a bit. They're the ones who are tasked with doing a mission by God, and it is going to be one angel, one mission. So they don't multifocus and they don't multitask. They have one thing to do, and they are absolutely targeted on that one mission and that one goal. We have the temple ministering angels, the Seraphim and the Kruvim. Those are very fierce. They're not cute. They're not cuddly. They're very fierce because they're guarding things, and they are zeroed in on guarding in. So we would maybe want to take a step back and not get too close to those kinds of angels. We have the myriads, the multiplying angels, and all they do is create hundreds of thousands of myriads of angels, and they're coming out of rivers of fire, and that's how they're multiplying their numbers to such extent. We know there are guardian angels. There are guardian angels for people. There are guardian angels for nations. Things go up in the realms above. Things happen between these guardian angels that are going to impact their charges. It's going to impact who they are guarding, whether it is a person or whether it is a nation. And so our text would watch very carefully about what's going on with the guardian angels. We know that there are angels that carry personal names. These are the permanent angels. An angel like Michael, Gabriel, Raphael. These are the angels that are in charge of certain aspects and they are permanent and therefore they carry names. And interestingly, we have redeeming angels. Those are the ones where Jacob teaches us about them and they're extremely powerful. We each get one and we cherish them. Everything in the world, we are told, every relationship has an angel. Every action that occurs births an angel. 
And so they're constantly enlarging their numbers and constantly impacting the world around us. As an example of some of them, we're told in the Talmud that there are angels of prayer. And according to that, Rabbi Pinchas tells us that when Israel prays, because we are praying in different parts of the world and prayers are going on all the time, are they in fact all spontaneously rising up above? And according to this rabbi, no, the angels of prayer are collecting all the prayers, weaving them into beautiful garlands and then presenting them to God in a very beautiful ornamental way because it helps our prayers get answered. And remember, there are older siblings. So they do want to help us out. And they do want us to be able to fulfill those prayerful moments that we express so well. We also, each of us gets a teaching angel so that when we are in utero and our bodies are forming, so are our souls. And according to the Talmud, we have a teaching angel who is teaching us the Torah start to finish while we are forming in utero. And then it says that as soon as a light appears, the angel approaches, slaps the baby on its mouth, and causes it to forget all the Torah completely. And the light they're talking about is the light of birth. So at the end of the birth canal, the baby will see light, will move toward it, and at that moment, the teaching angel will come, slap the baby on the mouth, creating that indented divot that we all have here. That's the fingerprint of our angel. And what happens as a result of that is we forget all the Torah we learned. Now, as life begins, the journey of our lives is the journey of rediscovery, not a journey of discovery. It's why we will encounter moments and they feel right. And we can't express it in words. And they feel right because it's connecting with the original Torah learning that our teaching angel guided us through. There are messenger angels. And the Talmud tells us that in order to complete that mission that they have, they will be formed in whatever way helps them complete the mission. They can take the form of a man, they can take the form of a woman, they can take the form of a child, they can take the form of anything in nature, which will include an animal, a snowstorm, a rainstorm, a windstorm, anything that helps them complete the mission. Sometimes snowstorms and windstorms delay people and it stops them from getting to where they're going so that other things can take place while they're delayed. And the rabbis could very well say, oh, that was an angel charged with delaying that person so the other event could happen. There are Shabbat angels, and it tells us in the Talmud, it was taught two ministering angels accompany each person on the eve of Shabbat from the synagogue to their home, one a positive angel, one a negative angel, when the person arrives home and finds the lamp burning and the table is set for Shabbat, the positive angel says, may it even be so on every Shabbat. And the negative angel must say, amen. But if the house is chaotic and there is discord in the home and things are not harmonious at all, the negative angel will say, may it be so every Shabbat. And the positive angel has no choice but to say, amen. We are the ones who set our destinies. The angels are the ones who support us. And we do have the free will to choose negative things. The angels will support us with that. We know that when we sing Shalom Aleichem on Friday night, we are welcoming angels into our home. And notice each verse very clearly. First thing is we welcome them into our home. We invite them to be with us. We ask them to give us a blessing. And then we say, oops, time to go. And we escort them out. We don't want them hanging around our homes for too long because we don't really understand them and they make us nervous. They can be fierce, they can be brutal, we're not quite sure we understand it, so we want that interaction and then we want to be able to, with all respect and dignity, escort them to the next home. They're woven into every part of our world. According to the Talmud, there is not a single blade of grass that grows without its angel tapping the ground above it and encouraging it to grow. We create angels with our actions and we destroy angels with our actions as well. We're told in the Talmud that when two friends see each other after having been apart for 12 months, they should actually make the blessing for resurrection of the dead. And it's a really strange moment because clearly neither one has passed away. They're meeting each other again. So why would they say that blessing to bless God for resurrecting the dead? And the Talmud says, no, no. What they're talking about is the friendship angel. 
that when two people create a friendship, an angel is born, and it becomes the friendship angel that is to guard and nurture the friendship. And every action these two people do in the friendship is feeding the angel and keeping it healthy. But when they part and they don't see each other, the angel weakens. And how long does it take for a friendship angel to die? 12 months. And then when the friends see each other again, that angel is spontaneously resurrected. That's why we say the blessing for the resurrection, because we are talking about the angel of the friendship. We are not talking about each other. One of the most powerful things that we have, as I mentioned, is our redeeming angel. And Jacob, our forefather, is the one who taught to us about this. Every person gets one redeeming angel, and it means that should there be a decision, God forbid, in the court above, should somebody get a decision that would be an ultimate price to pay, that their lives would end, then their redeeming angel can step forward in the heavenly court and say, take me instead, I redeem them. And everybody gets one more chance. We all get one redeeming angel. But what we've learned to do from Jacob is we actually, when we say Shema at night, we say, Hamalach HaGoeloti, the angel who redeems me, should now bless these young people. I am moving my redeeming angel onto my children. I am moving them onto all children. So that we learn to protect the next generation with our angels. And by saying to our redeeming angel, don't redeem me, Go and protect them. And watch if every generation is doing this, then by now we all have thousands, hundreds of thousands of these redeeming angels. Some will protect us. We are moving them to the next generation and we're creating this web of angelic protection. We use our relationship with angels to secure all the children in the world. We use our understanding of angels to help us heal the world. We respect them as our older sibling species. And as with all older sibling relationships, sometimes we pester them. Sometimes we annoy them. Sometimes they complain to God about having to take care of us all the time, like older siblings would. But come what may, we cherish their existence and we wouldn't have it any other way. 